what you said years ago without context. And then she went through all the things Dr. Longo had said. And I want to tell you what the context was in case it's forgotten. First, she said, he testified for me too. He testi testified that Scott's fertilizer, um, where they used vermiculite, that it was okay that they had used optical and XRD. You recall that? So, and remember what Dr. Longo was saying? He said there was no dispute that there was asbestos in vermiculite. We weren't looking to see if it was there. They had coated their vermiculite with a resin, and they were using basic methodology to see if anything got outside the resin. That's the context. The next thing she said, well, at one point, before he started testifying against Johnson & Johnson, he had said that there was some insulating cement that was 0.5% asbestos, and he said he didn't think it would cause a very big exposure. And then you saw the context of that deposition where he was talking about it. He said, yeah, the guy was an insulator. He was exposed to insulation every day. And then he said they then tested that product, and he said there was a whole lot of asbestos that got free. He said he didn't recall. I mean, remember, she showed all the prior testimony. She said he was asked over and over, did you ever test cosmetic topping? He said, I didn't remember doing it. And then he went back and looked, and someone else at his lab had tested gold bond. Okay? And it was a negative. Just like he still sometimes gets negatives. That's the context. The four off-the-shelf samples, right? The, there were four off-the-shelf samples that were negative. They were off the shelf in the last two years. They were Chinese. Most of the Chinese is, is better than the Vermont and the Italian. And then she said, well, why are you publishing on this? This big, dangerous thing, why are you publishing on it? And he said, be patient. They're working on it. They've only been testing these things for two years. They're still working on it, as he testifies. And the FDA audit that she brought up, remember? It's not about asbestos. It's confidential. <coughs> else. And they still have their FDA lab number. The bottom line is, they didn't bring in any of their people to tell you what their results were. No expert to say, Dr. Long goes wrong. Just peripheral stuff. He made $30 million. Right? The lab has, it has three labs. They have four electron microscopes that cost a million bucks a piece. This is a big operation. And since 1985, yes, they've built that much money. Did, did the money create these, these photographs? No. Dr. Compton, he tested samples gathered by defense experts, right, of the source form for both Vermont and Italian, right? 80% of the Italian was positive for asbestos and 85% of the Vermont. <coughs> then it was verified by J3. Remember, Dr. Longo sent uh, his results to J3, another lab who then verified the results. So we have Dr. Longo's work, we have Dr. Compton's work, and then we have a third party that verified the results. Ms. Sullivan put up a diagram where she said, oh, they couldn't even figure fibers versus bundles. Remember that? It said 95% disagreement. And Dr. Longo had told you why that was completely wrong and completely misleading. First of all, Dr. Longo testified that under the counting rules, for something to be a bundle, you have to see three fibers. And we looked at this exact document, or this exact picture, and said, well, Dr. Longo, is that a fiber or a bundle? And he said, well, you could count it as two if you look here. It's somewhat subjective. Or you could look at the end where it's stair-stepped, and it looks like more than two. So your analyst could say, well, that's just a fiber because they only see two, or they could say it's a bundle because they see more than two. It's sort of subjective. But whether it's a fiber or a bundle, it's regulated asbestos, it's countable asbestos. The fiber bundle is an additional detail they add on their count sheets. But then J3, they sent the samples to J3 to check fiber versus bundle, whether or not they were accurate. And it was 91% accurate. Again, we, this is science. This is an innuendo, right? Ms. Sullivan kept saying, where's the science? Where's, this is the science. <laughs> they didn't bring any of their science. They had these samples. Everybody got half. One last thing is, 
when they sent the PLMs, right, so for the light microscopy, they sent that to Dr. Poy's lab, J3, and Dr. Longo had found 8 of 20 by PLM of the 20 samples, and <coughs> J3 didn't see any, and Dr. Longo explained why, two reasons. One is their optics are far better, and two, they spend far more time on it. They spend an average of three hours per sample looking at each one. Some were shorter than others. And again, this is one of those things. Ms. Sullivan said, well, we saw that if it's three hours per sample, then there's more than they, they apparently have days longer than 24 hours at MAS because how could you do all these samples in that much time? And Dr. Longo sat here and he said, well, I'm looking at the count sheets. And one took an hour, one took two. The next one, they only did two samples. They took four hours apiece. It just depends. Science is it's not going to be the same every time. You know, Miss Sullivan said in a new statement, she said, you know, the truth shouldn't take that long to tell. I agree. The truth is, there's asbestos in baby powder. That's the truth. But when you don't say it, Right? And we have to dig it up. It takes a lot. She said, Dr. Longo didn't even do the analysis. He didn't even do it. Where's the people that did the analysis? MAS has technicians who do the analysis on the TEMs. But you saw this. This is their experts' count sheet. Dr. Compton showed you this. This is why that is so absolutely misleading and so wrong. Because you saw this. This is Dr. Sanchez's count sheet. You see the operator there? For TEM, does that say Matt Sanchez? No, it says John Swope, their technician. It's so disingenuous to say Dr. Longo didn't even look at it. He didn't even do the work. No, the technicians on the TEMs do the work. He set up the protocol. He wrote the report. He synthesized it and put it all together, just like their expert does. Why didn't they bring their own guy? What is asbestos? It's a fibrous asbestos. The body does not care how it grows. That's a fact. And Dr. Hopkins said, fibrous tremolite is asbestos. Right? We got him one time to give a clean answer. Fibrous tremolite is asbestos. These are their definitions of asbestos. <coughs> fibrous, one of those, it's asbestos. It's not much more complicated than that, ladies and gentlemen. The body cares if it's a fiber. That's all it cares about. Not a chunk. If it's a chunk, it's not a fiber. It's not going to cause cancer. A Hera, same thing. Hera said, asbestos, you have to have morphology, crystal structure, and chemistry. We had that from every single documented fiber. They said non-asbestos is anything missing one of those three things. That's what the EPA says. And we got that from every single one. Dr. Weber came in. Remember, he's, he was an inspector assessor. So he was actually inspecting these labs. This is a person who knows what asbestos is. And he's a lab inspector. And he came and he told you, look, if it is a fiber and it's one of those six regulated minerals, it's asbestos. That is different than what a commercial deposit might say it is. And I'll show you something on that too. One of the things that Ms. Sullivan brought up was that um, the FDA in 2010, they did some testing of different um, talcs, including Johnson & Johnson, didn't find anything in any of them. And the method they used was Dr. Weber's, but the method he wrote was the four-tile method. Do you remember that? That this was a transmission electron microscope method for identifying and quantitating asbestos in non-friable, organically bound bulk samples. <coughs> organically bound, floor tiles. That's what the lab, and it wasn't the FDA that did the testing. That's very important. It was a contract lab that decided to use that method. So these are just some of the pictures. Okay. These are long fibers. Depending on the method, it's either 3 to 1 or 5 to 1 aspect ratio, right? Length to width. 43 to 1, 28 to 1, 34 to 1, 28 to 1. So you've heard the expression, right? That it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, walks like a duck. It's duck. That's pretty simple. All through the trial, we've 
ask you to use your common sense, right? So that's a gut. So let's talk about some of the evidence, okay, of what asbestos is. This is Dr. Atanis' uh, paper that he wrote. It says the biological hazard of asbestos arises from inhalation of fibers. Physical properties such as length, diameter, length to width, aspect ratio, and texture and chemical properties are believed to be determinants of fiber distribution and disease severity, right? What causes disease? The size of change. The size of change. Not whether a geologist or someone else might say, this isn't commercial asbestos enough, right? It's the size of change. The amphiboles, e.g. anisite and chrysotile, are widely accepted as being more hazardous than chrysotile. We have his opinion on that. They are dusty and biopersistent owing to their structure and straight needle-like fibers. Needle-like was a big part of this case. It's one of the words that Johnson & Johnson used instead of calling things asbestos. Dr. Hopkins said, the needle-like structure of asbestos and asbestiform minerals is the quality that gives it the ability to embed in pulmonary tissue and potentially lead to mesothelioma. That's Dr. Hopkins. So now you have Dr. Atanus and Dr. Hopkins, needle-like. And then you have Bill Ashton, 1971. Colorado School of Mines did an analysis. And they said, we consider the free non-talc needles but a trace, both on a count and area basis, those particles are like. That's asbestos. And here's a picture from Dr. Longo's testing. There's a needle. It actually almost looks exactly like that hypodermic needle there. Needles, tremoline. That's asbestos. It's not, it's not hard, regardless of how complicated Johnson & Johnson tried to make it in this case. Remember, she said, where's the hairy rock? And this, again, this is one of those times where I'm going to point out to you why this was incredibly misleading. She said, where's the hairy rock? Because look, look, here's what, here's what Dr. Longo found. What's the difference between these two? <coughs> Ten times magnification? 10,000 times magnification. That is, it was so incredibly misleading to say, where's the hairy rock? You're not going to see hairy rocks in tau. It's ground up. So you see individual fibers. Again, this was easy to show you, easy to disprove what they had done. I'm shocked they did it, frankly. So years later, right? No speaking objections overruled. Continue. Years later, they got sued. Okay, right. So after all of this happens, and they predicted they were going to get sued. They predicted it in 1969. It was Dr. Thompson. I'll show you that document. What did they do? Because remember, they would just refer to it internally. They would refer to it as tremolite needles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They didn't feel the need, the need, as we heard here, to say, oh, if it's asbestos, you have to say asbestos. But they changed their tack. What did they do? Ms. Sullivan said, why would we have to talk about cleavage fragments if there's asbestos there? She said, we injected this idea of cleavage fragments, you remember? So cleavage fragments did non-asbestos stuff. The reason we had to talk about it, and you saw this with Dr. Compton, is because Dr. Sanchez calls what he finds in the samples cleavage fragments. That's why we. This was discussed with Dr. Compton very early in the case. Cleavage fragments, and I asked Dr. Compton. I said, "Is that is that proper to do under that methodology?" He said, "No." But that's why we talk about cleavage fragments. We didn't inject that into this case. What we found was asbestos. But when you have someone calling it cleavage fragments, you have to address that. So we did. They opened the playbook. This was a playbook, and it started in 1973. This is from 1973. Here is Exhibit 2450, okay? Remember, there was a company called R.T. Vanderbilt. They owned the New York mine. And they were trying to persuade people that the tremolite in their mine was something different than asbestos. But it was the same thing. And so J&J and, and John Vanderbilt were talking about a meeting about this. And it says, John Vanderbilt is going to take the position that tremolite is an asbestos mineral, <coughs> and they will not go along with the type of science which Vanderbilt has been indicating in the confusing mineralogy of talc. 
good rocks, bad rocks. Right? Exactly what happened in this case, exactly what they learned from R.T. Vanderbilt in 1973 is what happened here. Good rocks and bad rocks. The problem is that this has been explicitly rejected by anybody who's looked at this concept. So they took the duck and they just said, it's a cleavage fragment. Right? It's not asbestos, it's a cleavage fragment. Don't believe your eyes. Don't believe your own eyes. See, the only eyes that matter in this case are yours. Because you're the judges of the facts. And so, what they tried to do through this whole case was say, when you see these long fibers that are inhalable fibers, believe they're something else. Believe that they're not asbestos fibers. Confuse the mineralogy of those out. NIOSH, uh, ISO, ASTM, OSHA, EPA, they've all rejected the concept of good rocks and bad rocks. They have all said, if you have a fiber of any of these minerals, it is regulated asbestos. USGS, US Geological Survey, 2006. Dr. Meeker says, Finally, it seems appropriate in light of the issues addressed in this report to stress that it is absolutely not the role of the analytical or mineralogical communities to make health-based decisions or to make independent analytical assessments that directly or indirectly influence health-based outcomes. In other words, what a geologist might call it has no relevance to health-based outcomes. It is the obligation of the analytical or mineralogical communities to provide accurate, unbiased, and scientifically sound information to the health and regulatory communities so that appropriate and informed health-related policy and regulatory decisions can be made. We should also point out that the counting criteria developed for analysis of asbestos in the workplace or in commercial products may not be appropriate for direct application to what is currently referred to as naturally occurring asbestos. This is the geologist saying, look, if you have a health-based situation, we're going to count asbestos differently than someone who's assessing a commercial deposit. Same year. However, asbestos form describes a crystal growth habit with unique properties such as flexibility and high tensile strength, properties that have never been directly linked to disease. Therefore, using the term asbestos form, to differentiate a hazardous from a non-hazardous substance has no foundational basis in the medical sciences. Of course, the real issue lost in these arguments is not what fits someone's mineralogical or commercial definition of asbestos, but what is toxic. And that's why we call people like Dr. Brody, who's actually studied asbestos effects on the cells and DNA. That's why we brought Dr. Moline and Dr. Webb and Dr. Uh, Mattis to talk about those same things. The EPA answered this question in 2006. They said, for purposes of public health assessment and protection, EPA makes no distinction between fibers and cleavage fragments of comparable chemical composition, size, and shape. They said, from a health standpoint, there is no different, no evidence that supports making a distinction between the two. I'm going to skip ahead. In terms of epidemiological data and health outcomes, the cleavage fragment argument is without merit. That's our EPA. So, these are some of the pictures of some of the asbestos that is found in Exhibit 3695-47. And if you choose to look at these, remember that every single one of these is regulated asbestos, and that's undisputed in this case. It's undisputed. As much as Johnson & Johnson tried to attack Dr. Longo and attack Dr. Compton, it's undisputed these are regulated asbestos <coughs> And then these are some of the PLM, right? So those I just showed you were TEM photos. These are the light microscope photos. Those are all in there as well. But I want to bring this up because counsel brought this up. She says, look at this, folks. Even Dr. Longo doesn't call it asbestos, right? Because it doesn't say the magic word asbestos. And why is that misleading? We showed you this with Dr. Longo. Look at the count sheet filled out by the, by the uh, analyst. Comments, exemplite, germline, and anthophylite asbestos observed. For the same sample, M69042, S002. This is just the picture. Right? How, how
how, how base is it to say, look at the picture, it doesn't say asbestos, so see you're being misled. It's kind of cheap right here. All of Dr. Longo's and Dr. Compton's testing is undisputed by any expert. They had the samples too. And then lastly, on this issue of asbestos, Dr. Longo went through and he showed you pictures where they had taken asbestos out of traditional asbestos products, brakes, joint compound, gaskets, and packing, and shows that there's no difference between the asbestos they're finding in the Johnson's baby powder and what they found in those products. And they compared them to known references, right? The National Institute of Standards and Technology, there it is. There's asbestos right out of the recognized standard. It's the exact same. There's asbestos in this by anybody's definition. Anybody's definition. The counting protocols that were followed for regulated asbestos or Johnson and Johnson. There's also a consistency here. This is something I noticed as I was looking at the results between the ore and the finished product. Remember this concept of there is some sorting, there is some um, processing that occurs between the ore and the finished product. So check this out. So in ore, for the Italian, it was 80% positive. And in the finished product, MAS had about 65% positive. So you lose about 15% between the ore and the finished product. And then check out the Vermont about 14%. So that's some pretty incredible consistency between the raw ore and then what you actually wind up with in the finished product. And Dr. Longo at MAS and MVA, Dr. Compton, they didn't work together on these. Those were independent. So you see that relationship between the raw ore and what goes in the final product. So based on just their testing, if you buy 10 bottles between 7 and 8, are going to contain detectable asbestos. But it's extremely important to remember, and this is for the Vermont and, and Italian years. In the Chinese years, it's going to be between three and four. Okay? But the important thing to remember here is that Dr. Longo said, look, there's, a, there's an error rate. And I think one of, one of our jurors asked the question of, I believe it was Dr. Longo, how do you take a result from a, a small portion of the talc and relate that to the whole bottle. And he talked about how it's homogenized, and so you can relate it to the entire bottle or the entire sample because it's homogenized, um, which means mixed up. So it's not like you have a big chunk of it here and then nothing anywhere else. And he talked about the fact that, but you also have to accept that if you have a non-detect bottle, because remember, he's not going down to absolute zero. There's not enough time in the world for that. That some of those bottles that were non-detect, if you went down further, would likely be detected. But at where he was, you had between 7 and 8 positive for every 10 